started, but let's get started. So good morning and welcome to our first ever virtual summit for recycling. This is very exciting. This is actually the 31st year of the summit and we're so excited to offer an action packed agenda with a focus on circular economies and our ever important communities and policies. Uh, a huge, you know, Recycle Colorado emphasis on collaborations among stakeholders, as we always do, and uh, definitely innovations in technology and processes. Um, so for today, make sure you pop on to the Business Partner Showcase later this morning, and then also be sure to say hello to your local legislators during the meet and greet session. That is going to be fun. Um, then this afternoon, uh, make sure to check out the sessions focused on circularity, policy, grant funding, and food waste reduction. And now, without further ado, we will kick off the summit with our keynote session, Circular Economies for Resiliency and Efficiency, facilitated by the wonderful Alicia Marseille. Uh, Alicia serves as the Director of Innovation at Arizona State University, working to advance innovative solutions for complex changes related to sustainability. So with that, Alicia, take it away. Good morning, Brandy. Thank you. And welcome everybody to today's kickoff session for Recycle Colorado. Really excited to be here. I'm here with my colleague Raj. <clears throat> I'll introduce in a second. We are um, not located in Colorado. Um, unfortunately, at this time of year for us, we are in um, Arizona, the blazing desert, and uh, part of Arizona State University. And for the last five years, we have uh, worked in partnership with the city of Phoenix to accelerate circular economy. So we're excited to um, today and tomorrow share some of the lessons um, that we've learned over the, this period and um, excited to kick off today's session. So without further ado, um, my colleague Raj is going to give a short presentation next. Thanks, Alicia. And I'll let him give. Thanks, Alicia. Good morning, everyone. Um, and um, I'll start with a brief intro uh, that you can see in front of you. But I've been with ASU for about eight years. Uh, the majority of that spending uh, time on our partnership with the City of Phoenix on developing the circular economy economic development platform that we've built um, over the years. And I'll talk about that in my presentation. Next slide, please. And next. So I think, I don't think Alicia mentioned it, but we're with the Robin Melanie Walton Sustainability Solutions Service, which is a knowledge uh, building partnering uh, uh, service that, that we provide as external facing out of ASU. So I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about the uh, linear economy that I'm sure you're all familiar with, but just uh, provide some context to uh, what we're gonna talk about today and then at the, for the Recycling Colorado Summit uh, and, the, and the focus area. Uh, so our unsustainable linear economy, as you've all probably already heard, is, is the take make waste economy where we are assuming that we have infinite resources available in, on the planet and then uh, infinite regenerative capacity of the planet to give us those resources back. Um, while we've assumed that that's continued to happen, um, a con a continually available in the background, we have uh, been extracting about 12, 12 tons per person uh, on the planet in 2017, and that's going to uh, go up to about 19 billion tons of per uh, per person by 2060. So, uh, you know, we're we're extracting at an unprecedented rate, and it's just accelerating even faster. And by 2030, even more. Uh, middle-class consumers are going to enter the global market uh, and you can imagine how uh, this might affect Colorado when you scale it down to the Colorado level as Colorado's population grows and urbanization continues to happen middle-class growth happens and consumption of products and resources continues to happen uh, next slide please so this slide is a is, is a world map of known sources of e-waste and destinations of e-waste. So you can see how our linear economy works globally just for e-waste where 
uh, on this map, only five of the largest e-waste producers are shown as green dots, and all the red and maroon dots show you where they, all that waste ends up. So it shows you how we function and how we dump some of our waste into the lower income countries or the developing economies around the world. Next slide, please. And then here's a, a, a world map um, by, pr produced by Ocean Cleanup on uh, the plastic waste that's generated and mismanaged. So uh, you can see all the yellow and a few sprink smattering of red, orange and red areas around the world where plastic waste is mismanaged and essentially uh, a large part of that ends up in the oceans and we get the plastic gyres and we get plastic waste washing up on beaches. Uh, so that's that's another aspect of our linear economy that mis, uh, that uh, is dysfunctional. Go ahead, next slide, please. And then here uh, we're looking at how the cities of the world are going to grow. In this map, you can see in 2010 the yellow, orange, and red cities of the world. And I'm going to ask uh, Tom. I think you're controlling the slides. If you can toggle between this slide and the next slide. And you can see between 2010 and 2030 uh, where all that growth is going to happen. As you can see, there's quite a bit of growth in Latin America, Africa, but a, but a massive amount in Southeast Asia. So uh, lots of growth happening around the world. That's where all the urbanization is going to happen. That's where all the consumption is going to happen. And of course, you can then apply that kind of logic to where is that going to happen in Colorado and um, get a sense for how uh, material flow is going to happen. Next slide, please. So let's just quickly talk about circular economy and I'm going to talk about some examples um, to wrap up my presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so everybody uh, should have heard of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's uh, efforts to accelerate circular economy. It started in 2010 in Europe and we're now, of course, doing it in the US. They are also over here partnering with GreenBiz. Um, but this diagram here um, shows you on the left side the biological cycles all the, or the organic materials that, that are essentially already circular in the world. Uh, there's some feedstocks or some waste streams that we do mismanage even on the, inor on the organic side. On the right side you see the technical cycles or the inorganic materials that we extract from the planet. Uh, we turn it into products, turn them into products, and then very little of it uh, actually comes back around for reuse, remain, uh, repurposing, recycling, um, as we all know. So, um, uh, and then of course on the left side of the principles for, uh, for circularity. Next slide, please. So let's just look at some examples and I'll talk about what we're doing at ASU also. So if you've heard of loop industries, um, they were started by uh, TerraCycle uh, in partnership with uh, Nestle, uh, Unilever, and UPS. But the idea is that you, you create a subscription service for, for uh, certain types of foods and household goods that you need. Uh, it's going to be offered in uh, seven countries. It's uh, soon enough. And then uh, right now, they're partnered with about 30 brands to deliver this service. Um, so this is, this is uh, a, the Loop's attempt at basically getting rid of packaging uh, by subscribing um, to just the food you need and, and leaving the empties at your door, so to speak. Um, next slide, please. The Go Box is an example of a food packaging uh, uh, bo box uh, or plastic package service that's available in Portland, but it's an example of how organic uh, um, food leftovers from restaurants can be taken home in a plastic container and it can, the box can be returned to any other participating restaurant. Um, and it's a service that's uh, widely used in the Portland area. And it eliminates styrofoam and other plastic or packaging waste. The Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative, an example of uh, a statewide system uh, that Oregon's uh, put in place to, uh, it's a, a beverage container deposit system that uh, recovers 13 million uh, pounds of plastic a year, uh, 100 million pounds of glass a year, 
Um, I think they do 25,000 truckloads of recovered material a year uh, through bottle drop centers um, and recovery programs. Next slide, please. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing at ASU. At ASU, we take, a, of course, as a university, we take a, a more holistic and academic or evidence-based or science-based approach. And we look at how all of these areas are going to evolve in the future and what role circularity, circularity plays in all of these. So uh, it's about urban regions. It's about value chains. It's about communities. It's about collaboration. All uh, sectors of the economy and society are going to have to work together. And it's the future of discovery. It's the, how can we find new solutions or better solutions? Next slide, please. Here are some of the impacts of the work we've done over the last eight years. Uh, we've, we've worked in many countries. Uh, we've worked with many different funders and many types of organizations. And we engage faculty and students in doing the work we do. Next slide, please. And so our Resource Innovation Solutions Network is our signature circular economy project uh, that we developed uh, with the city of Phoenix. We've done more than 25 projects with them. Um, we've uh, collaborating, collaborated with neighboring uh, cities and the private sector uh, partners in the Phoenix area. We won an EDA grant to build a RISEN incubator and accelerator that Alicia ran for three years. And you can see some of the stats from that incubator uh, effort. On the left side here, you see um, logos of the companies that came out of the incubator uh, RecycleOps is a Uber type recycling subscription service for rural areas and even uh, uh, multifamily housing in urban areas. Renewlogy, uh, they take plastic waste and turn it into resin or diesel fuel uh, using pyrolysis. Pyrolysis has been around for decades, but the innovation that, uh, that they've come up with is they've modularized and miniaturized the technology so that it's the size of a small conference room or even uh, smaller than that. Um, so these are some of the examples of, of the kind of companies, kinds of companies that have come out of the Risen Incubator. And next slide. And I believe that's my last slide. So that's a little bit of a summary of the linear economy, circular economy, and some examples uh, and what we're doing in Phoenix. Alicia? Yeah, thank you, Raj. So I, got, I just realized watching that Risen Incubator slide that I really forgot to tell a little bit about myself. And uh, my, my background is primarily in economic development. And I'm really excited in watching what's been happening in Colorado unfold with the, the new policies that's happening to drive the Recycling Innovation Center. Raj and I uh, were fortunate to come to, to Denver uh, in December um, not an ideal time for Arizonans, but uh, it was an amazing trip and really got to see the landscape and the different, um, um, different types of entities across the value chain there in, um, in Colorado in terms of making something like this come to life in terms of the efforts that the, the state and the different entities are leading. And um, understanding the landscape is definitely a crucial component in circularizing regions. Um, Raj, do you want to uh, provide some insights in regards to the importance of um, landscape assessments and really understanding stakeholders and materials when you're looking to drive these types of efforts? Uh, yeah, Alicia, thanks. Thanks for that question. Yeah, we found that in the for the Phoenix project, uh, uh, in the early years, we were doing. Um, projects as defined by the city, uh, what was important for their waste stream at the time. But it became clear fairly early on that we need to, needed to do a landscape assessment. We really needed to understand what waste streams they had, where they were coming from, where they were going, uh, what possible solutions could then come out of that. Before we could identify solutions, we need to understand the, the actual uh, policies, the actual players, the actual uh, technical uh, aspects of the of the waste stream. So there was a lot of uh, that assessment that needed to be done to to make sure we fully understood the uh, the, the problem. Yeah, and I um, 
I think what was amazing about that process um, and part of the landscape assessments was it was really tailored and specific to the what was happening in the city historically, but then also thinking about going forward, um, what, how to circularize it and being able to anticipate. Because um, as we know, economies are not static, they're really dynamic, a lot of things are, are changing. And so um, that, would defi- that was definitely a challenge. And then also thinking about the changes that happen with materials and, and brands changing, packaging, um, that's one example of a challenge. Can you think of other challenges, Raj, through some of the work that we did through Risen or through other circular economy-based projects? Um, any challenges that were presented that ha- we had to rethink about kind of what we were doing or to, to pivot? Yeah, so green organics is a good example of the region-wide challenge of organic waste. Um, each municipality was, is managing, even today, managing their own waste, organic waste. And uh, it became clear to all the stakeholders, all the municipal stakeholders that were participating in the program, that a region-wide solution would be better than, uh, you know, there's 28 municipalities around Phoenix. So having, you know, 10, 15, 20 different organics processing systems in place wasn't the right answer. There had to be some optimal, uh, optimal number of facilities. So that was a, you know, that was a realization that the stakeholders came to after understanding all of um, the fact that they had very similar waste streams. Yeah, yeah. And organics is such a large part of, of waste streams, an important one to think about solving. Um, I yeah, see the- Brandy posted in the chat box if there's any questions for panelists so far, so, um, or for Raj. So please feel free to um, chime in. I'm sorry, Raj, I cut you off there. What were you going to say? No, that's okay. The other, the other uh, challenge was uh, uh, in the in the plastic stream. You know, we we came to the realization that Phoenix thought they had a lot more plastic than they actually had, uh, based on the analysis. So there were projections being made, but when they actually uh, asked us to look into it in detail, uh, there was a realization that you know what, we actually don't have as much waste in Maricopa County as we thought plastic waste. Uh, And we actually might have to get into the business of importing plastic waste if we're to build our own processing facility. So just a couple examples uh, of uh, getting enlightened because of the uh, analysis that we assisted them with. Yeah, that was that was a massive realization that uh, we looked at the economic impact of material streams and the one that had the greatest return in terms of economic development was uh, PET. And so we worked with the city of Phoenix to understand regionally um, the amount of PET available. And to give you a frame of reference, geographically, Metro Phoenix is the size of the state of Maryland, and it's the fifth largest populated um, city in the country. And so still, we did not have enough PET uh, to actually cite a or attract a processor for plastics. Um, I see David Oliver has a question in terms of what was the team, size of the team driving the coordination of the, the project. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, and, go ahead. No, go ahead, Alicia. Uh, roughly 20, 20, uh, 20 individuals um, on our team uh, driving the RISEN efforts. And, um, you know, that includes support staff, but a large part of our work also engages uh, faculty and students. The faculty provide a tremendous amount of um, insights and there's over 600 faculty who are across the point and under sustainability and other disciplines like engineering, construction, design that we pull into projects also based on their expertise. Yeah, about half of those were full-time and about the other half were, uh, you know, faculty and students and support staff coming in, uh, in and out as needed based on the type of work. Yeah. Uh, Vanessa asked a really good question. Risen's not expanding to Tucson um, and current legislation um, is not happening in Arizona in this space. And I think that's why you'll notice that Raj and I are pretty green with envy um, for the policy and and things that are happening in Denver in terms of a supportive environment. Uh, Randy asked changes in the diversion rate over the span of the project and um, Yes, the diversion rate. Raj, do you remember those exact numbers? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So when we started the project, uh, the Phoenix area, city of Phoenix was at 16%. Uh, 
uh, and uh, their goal was to get to 40% by 2020 to leapfrog 34%, the national average. Uh, and uh, I think at the end of last year, they surpassed 38%. So um, yeah, uh, real substantial movement in the right direction. Great, thank you. So uh, there are um, some other questions, Alicia, in the uh, in the question Q and A box. Yep, I think we have time we, for one more before the the next panelist. Go ahead, Raj. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, there's a questions about lessons learned and approaches you had uh, done differently. I think I kind of answered that. Um, uh, we, we ended up doing more analysis of the waste stream and the landscape. Um, uh, we should have started with a deep dive into that first. And that's something that Phoenix initially didn't do, but um, so that was a, a good pivot for us. Uh, there's a question about circularizing uh, in rural areas. Uh, that's a very interesting question because we are doing a circular economy project for the Nature Conservancy on a small southern Pacific island of theirs where, where they have a research station uh, and they're trying to figure out how they come, come up with small scale, low-tech, low affordable technologies to uh, circularize that waste because it's an island and, uh, and they happen to have plastic washing up on the beach a lot and they're trying to find, find answers to that. So we're doing that research project right now. So stay tuned. And the idea of that is it's a living lab and the, the technologies yeah. could actually easily be transferred and utilized in a rural setting. Um, and uh, there's a really good question about C&D aggregates and our diversion rates. We don't have a C&D processor um, in Arizona at this time, but that's definitely something that has been, has been looked at. Um, and then if you want information on the ventures in the, the Risen Incubator, if you Google Risen Incubator, um, it'll actually take you to the ASU page to learn more. And the companies are um, self-generating, self uh, revenue generating. Some of them were able to get contracts and RFPs with the city of Phoenix. Um, part of the work that we did was to connect them to capital networks across the country for, to help them scale, um, debt and equity based capital, as well as grants. Um, so they are all still rocking and rolling. So I think we're going to actually go to our next panelist. Um, and our next panelist is uh, Jamie. Um, if we could go to the next slide here, Tom. We're going to come back to Betsy, I think. We're going to go to uh, Jamie's presentation next. Jamie, if you want to give us a, a brief introduction here and get started, sure. welcome and thank you for joining us. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jamie Harkins. I have worked as a sustainability coordinator for the city of Boulder for over 10 years now. Can't believe it's been so long. Um, I focus mainly on our policy and planning projects around zero waste and now more so moving to circular economy and how we integrate that into our updated climate action plan. Um, and so, yeah, I also have the pleasure of serving as mayor of the neighboring town of Lafayette, Colorado. So that's who I am. Next slide. Okay, so I'm here to, um, or actually, can you go back one more? Yeah, just an intro slide here. I'm here to tell you all about the work we did in 2019 with the consulting firm of Metabolic, which is based in Amsterdam, to really help us down this circular economy path. Um, many of you listening today are very familiar with the efforts Boulder's made over the years to move towards our zero waste goals. However, you know, as Raj so wonderfully laid out, um, it's become very clear to us, as with uh, many other cities, that to truly address the impact of waste and materials on our climate, the solution can't just be to recycle or compost although those are wonderful things. Uh, we began to wonder what the city's role is in moving towards a circular economy and realized we didn't even know exactly where to start because we didn't have a really good picture of what was coming in and out of the city. So I heard about something at the ICLE uh, World Congress a few years ago, an urban metabolism study. 
Um, it can also be called a material flow analysis. And so we um, brought me Metabolic on. They've done a lot of really great work with City of Charlotte around this topic too, to help us figure that out. So next slide. So the first question we had to start with with Metabolic was how circular is Boulder now? Um, so next slide. They really took a deep dive into our data and um, this just gives you a little bit of a depiction of where we're at right now. As you can see in the bar graph, the recycling and compost volumes are going up, but so is overall waste generation per person. Um, I think this is probably 2018, the highest level since we've been tracking data that total waste per person has been at. So you can see we're not really getting out of the problem by just recycling a lot more. Um, and I did just want to make a really quick note that these graphics on my slides come directly from our metabolic report. Um, so I realize some of them are going to be a little hard to see, um, but their graphics are so great I wanted to use them. But I will have a link at the end of the presentation where you can get the report and download it so you can see all these in much greater detail. Next slide. And this is super tiny, I realize it, but I wanted to give you an idea of what they produced for us. And so this is a very cool um, sand key diagram they produced to show the flow of materials in and out of Boulder. Um, now, anyone that works with data knows that this is going to be far from perfect. Right now, there's a lot of assumptions based into it. But Metabolic did use a bunch of methods to check their assumptions and adjust them with um, the contextual understanding of Boulder that they, they got through our project. So. Um, they did dozens of interviews, site visits, research and analysis of all sorts of impacts that were happening around the city and regionally. And you can see the inputs going into the commercial and public sector in purple, those big boxes, and then the household stream in light blue. Um, and then you can barely see like in the middle there what all those um, inputs are breaking down into types of products and types of waste. And then at the end, you can see just how little is um, recycled, compost, and reused. Um, this is very similar. Actually, it's better than when you look at one of these for the United States or the globe. Um, we do have more materials as a percentage being, you know, properly recycled and composted, but it's still, you know, a fraction of the inputs. And just this very small, uh, red triangles and green circles you see there, those um, I'll get into, they represent sort of the hot spots that Metabolic identified for us to start working on. Next slide. So here, um, through the process of creating this material flow, they really work to understand some key questions. So what is not going well in Boulder and what are the main impacts created um, by the current way we use resources? And then what are the structural barriers preventing a shift to more circularity? And then on the flip side, what is going well in Boulder that we can build on and what strengths do we have to support a transition to a circular economy? This led to um, what we really wanted, you know, as much as we wanted to see what was coming in and out, we really wanted to know where to, where to tackle first. So this led to a list of hotspots and opportunities for us to begin to focus our work on in the coming years. Some of them are listed here, um, and I'll tell you just about a, a few of them in the rest of my time here. Next slide. So this the first one is packaging waste. Um, they estimate about $2.3 million worth of materials are being sent to the landfill um, just in Boulder, which is pretty crazy to think about. Um, and up to 20% of that um, of our city's waste is mainly packaging materials. So. Um, Compared to other US cities, we consume more paper and glass per capita and less metals and plastics, which did show a, a slight preference for these packaging materials in Boulder. Um, and the paper and plastic recycling is definitely a gap in the region. Um, while developing local end markets is, you know, one way to create a more circular city, they really emphasize that another option is to move towards more reusable packaging. We heard about loop. Um, and models for that, that we can eliminate this material as much as possible. So their um, list of strategies for us includes things to do both of those, recycling more and also shifting away. Next slide. So another big portion, this won't surprise anyone of the city's waste is from construction and demolition. Um, globally, construction materials account for nearly a third of all material consumption and around 10% of all waste. Um, as you can see depicted in the graphic, 
and we don't even have a ton of building happening in Boulder compared to other cities, but it still represents annual and equivalent to 52 single family homes um, of construction waste. Um, in Boulder, more materials are going into the build environment than are coming out. Like I said, we're not, we don't have a ton of, you know, demolishing and rebuilding, but even so, it's really important. These materials such as um, buildings, of buildings such as doors, windows, fixtures, they're all really good candidates for direct reuse. We're really grateful to have Resource Central um, in Boulder that is resells these building products. So on the longer term, you know, really looking at this waste stream and seeing how we can scale that up um, and ensure that buildings can be used for longer and that the components and materials put into them can be more easily recovered um, after a building's lifespan is part of those strategies. Next slide. So the next hotspot was organic waste. Um, again, not surprising, um, precisely because of the impacts associated with food production. Um, this is a major priority, you know, eliminating food waste. Our annual food waste in Boulder is equivalent to 33 million pizzas being thrown away, which would, um, disappoint all our college students on the hill. <laughs> um, many of you know that globally nearly a third of uh, food is wasted and it never makes it to the plates of consumers. Boulder's home to a bunch of really great programs, some diversion uh, programs like Boulder Food Rescue, which could be structurally supported through policy. And so, you know, there's lots of options here. You know, once food becomes waste, you know, sure we can compost it, but there's also ideas around can it be used for animal feed to grow insects? Can we extr extract valuable components from them, from the food? So lots of really great strategies and thinking around how to deal with organic waste. Next slide. This is the final hotspot um, I'll highlight this morning. And it's one that really shows the potential of moving forward to a circular economy as a climate solution, which is something um, even within our climate department here in Boulder, zero waste wasn't always thought of it that way. So, and that's the embodied carbon in the materials and products we consume. So we have a lot of efforts locally to deal with our local energy consumption, of course. Uh, we have a whole department working on climate, but to truly address Boulder's contribution to climate change, we really have to develop a vision for reducing our impacts, not just in the city, but outside. Um, Cities are um, net importers of greenhouse gas emissions. We don't produce a ton locally. So this is a really, really key component. Um, so this assessment they did for us was far from a complete consumption-based inventory. I don't want folks to think we have it all figured out because everyone knows how hard that is. But it does provide a starting point for understanding the order of magnitude of consumption-based emissions in Boulder. And the huge takeaway, probably the biggest takeaway of the whole report for us was the emissions associated with the products coming into the city and used was bigger than all other sources of local locally produced emissions combined, which is really pretty amazing when you think about it, um, how big of a climate solution this could be. Um, so what that means is that even as just a small change in circularity can have an enor enormous overall impact. Um, if actions such as repair and reuse can reduce consumption by just a few percentage points, this can reduce emissions more than making significant reductions in local um, electricity use, for example. Um, so this was a huge take home for us. You know, they have some equivalents in this graphic, but it really just helped us reframe dealing with consumption and our materials as a huge part of our climate work in Boulder. Um, and I did just want to note related to this topic, one of the really key lessons we learned from metabolic was that you don't just want a circular economy, but you want to retain um, the material complexity and value of these inputs as long as possible. So once we put labor and energy and materials into making something, we want to try and, um, sorry, my puppy is playing with something right next to me here. <laughs> um, we want to make sure we um, retain the, the value and the complexity of those materials as long as possible as we move you know, and not just immediately downcycle them into something less valuable. So next slide. And here are just a few other, I threw in um, opportunities mentioned in the report, um, really bringing together and connecting climate adaptation with circularity, making sure those efforts reflect each other, um, scaling up local initiatives that are already happening, 
um, sharing best practices. And you all know how important developing local end markets is. So there was a big emphasis on that as well. Next slide. So just to give you an idea of all the, the whole body of work they did for us, we also had a um, community visioning session with great attendance, over 100 folks. Um, came out to really co-develop this vision for a circular boulder with us. And we explored a bunch of different themes around, of course, the environment and resiliency, but society, the economy and equity. Um, so this is just a visual depiction of that night that's also in the report. Next, next slide. And then finally, we did invite a group of local stakeholders to attend a roadmap workshop with us to really get into the weeds. So here are, are the hotspots and opportunities. What could this mean? policy and initiative wise. And I know you can't read these actual strategies. I just wanted to give you an idea of what it looks like in the report. But they identified a whole host, it's two pages long of strategies that address different priorities. And we really started to lay out a list of when we could do what. Um, where we left this though was we were about to take this whole report out to the community and have them weigh in on this roadmap and these strategies and that's when the pandemic hit. So we haven't been able to do that part of our engagement yet. So we will still, you know, be doing that and figuring out a way to have, have the public weigh in on this. But um, we're in a little bit of a holding pattern, but we are really confident that we can start working on a few of these opportunity areas right now. You know, the food we knew was a hot spot, C and D waste. So we're not waiting for that, but um, that is our next spot or our next step in this process. Um, next slide. And this is my last one. I just wanted to give you an idea. I have the report at um, this link. You can go, it'll just bring it up as a PDF and you can download it and read it. It's super interesting. So that's all I got. Thank you all. Thank you, Jamie. Um, feel free to uh, put a few questions here into the Q&A box for Jamie. We have a few minutes before we go to our next presenter, um, Betsy. And um, Jamie, I time I see the report, it's pretty amazing. The thank you diagram in terms of the materials flow is mind blowing. And you actually hit on the head something we've been talking a lot about at ASU um, in terms of not just looking at materials at the end of their life cycle, if you will, but really thinking about the materials coming into a community as products and or commodities um, and the impacts of that and specifically the GHGs. And if you look at that broadly, it's, it's pretty profound um, to think about the, the full impacts across the value chain. Um, has the city of Boulder thought about um, how to look at that further to, to not just measure, but to start to think about um, ways to have impacts across that value chain? I mean, yeah, we, we're, we constantly are. I mean, it's been a little harder in um, current times to advance some of these bigger strategies. We did shift in the last few months to really looking at how we can do short-term actions that relate to the pandemic recovery that also advance our goals. And so um, my whole department is thinking a lot about that. So one example is, you know, we, we're we about to launch a program to help restaurants um, transition to sustainable takeout where, um, so we, we kind of had to shift to a few shorter term strategies just given the pandemic, but um, absolutely. I mean, this is just the first step <laughs> in a lot of years yeah. of work that we'll be doing to have yeah. a greater, to really look at um, our impacts closer and find out the right solutions. Um, we are thinking a lot about reusables and how we can accelerate that. Like what is our role as a city in accelerating some of these models um, around reusable packaging. Yeah. And so, yeah, you, you're right on. It's a lot, there's a lot of work ahead yeah. of us still. No small effort by any means. And there's uh, one question before we go to the next mm -hmm. presenter, actually two that you can kind of merge into one here. Um, I think there's a positive response in regards to the metabolic study that you just showed and in terms of material imports and, um, you know, has the city started to think about what are the most carbon intensive um, areas that you're targeting? Um, and then secondly, second part of the question is, um, knowing that there's a huge contribution of materials that are uh, kind of adding to the problems around climate change, what's Boulder going to do beyond zero waste efforts? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the carbon intensity, I mean, they did build that into these top hot spots that they wanted us to tackle first. So absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the most important metrics we use to figure out where we go first. Um, and so I mean, I do think we need to dig in a little more with them as far as like 
like we know food and, and you know, and the C and D waste are huge carbon intensities. I think we need to dig in a little more into that embodied carbon analysis with them. Um, as far as beyond that, what we should tackle next. Um, but absolutely, the carbon intensity is, is one of the key metrics. Um, and so, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? <clears throat> um, it was in regards to now that the metabolic study has shown the mm -hmm. large contribution of the various materials uh, and carbon regarding climate change, what are some of the next efforts the city is right. going to do in regards to Got moving it. beyond zero waste? Yeah, I mean, that's, that is the whole question that drove this study was what it, what should that be? Um, we did do a bunch of, uh, we did just implement some C and D process, um, some new C and D policy. Um, we had a code update, a building code update. So we now for the first time have construction waste requirements for commercial buildings, not just residential. And we did institute a deposit program to really put some enforcement and some real teeth behind making sure folks properly, you know, recycle, but also as much as we can reuse what's coming out of our buildings. Um, the food we need to figure out still, I have to admit, food is a hard, other than just the waste, we've done efforts around food waste, but the whole food system is so carbon intensive and we are right now having discussions about what our role is in shifting that. So absolutely. Um, just before I, I lose my floor, I would also encourage folks to check out a, this um, Circular Charlotte report Metabolic did as well. Um, it's very interesting and they had some um, case studies in their report that we don't have of, of certain business ideas that could be fostered locally to help circularity. So that's also a good one to read if you're interested. Nice. Thank you, Jamie. So we're going to go to our next panelist now, Betsy Markey. Welcome, Betsy. We're elated to have you. Um, if you want to go ahead and give your uh, quick introduction and dive into your slides. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Thank, thanks very much. Thanks for, uh, for having me here today. I'm Betsy Markey. I'm the Executive Director of the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade. We refer to our office as OEDIT. Uh, you like acronyms here. Uh, but my background um, has been really both in the public and private sector. I've owned two businesses. I've uh, been a member of Congress from uh, Colorado. Um, I've worked um, uh, in the previous administration, uh, Department of Homeland Security and Small Business Administration. And, and uh, this is my first time in state government. Um, and it's really exciting to be uh, uh, working uh, with Governor Polis, um, who really believes um, in sustainability as really the cornerstone of, of Colorado's way of life. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and, and start the presentation. Thank you. So, um, you, you, know, you know, we know that we work with businesses all over the state um, and they also recognize that uh, resources are finite here in Colorado and, and uh, we, we know we honor the state and our great natural resources by ensuring that our policies and operations at the state level um, support a circular economy. You know, when, when Governor Polis came into office a year ago, we had four, um, you know, bold initiatives, and one of them uh, was making sure the state was 100% uh, renewable by 2040, um, and then positioning Colorado uh, really as a leader in the country um, in the clean energy economy. Uh, so I'm on a working group, um, cabinet level working group, uh, it's called our Energy and Renewables Working Group, and we really have three main goals. Number one um, is increasing the number of utilities uh, with an adopted plan uh, to increase renewable consumption. Uh, two, we're working to finish the development of the greenhouse gas roadmap and ozone state implementation plan. Um, and then three, we're uh, really working to ensure that all potential coal transition communities have the capacity, the expertise, and the resources uh, to develop their own comprehensive, locally driven plan to transition their um, economies to sustain their economic vitality. Um, so one of the things that we, we do is we work with stakeholders around the state to uh, mitigate the impacts of, of global warming, which, as you know, are, are already impacting our state in profound ways uh, from a shorter ski season 
uh, to a dwindling water supply, uh, to an agricultural section that's really struggling to raise crops and livestock through what's become more frequent droughts and, and natural disasters. Um, so why don't I go ahead and th thank you for uh, doing that next slide. So we'll go on to the, the next slide after this and start talking about some of the programs um, that we have um, at OEDIT to uh, support the industry. I'm gonna start with the Enterprise Zone Tax Credit Program. Um, and that program provides uh, state income tax credits to incentivize businesses that are located um, in an economically distressed area of the state. Um, and over the last uh, several years, actually um, from uh, 2014 through 2018, seven recycling companies um, in Colorado have um, earned um, Enterprise Zone Investment Tax Credits. And also during that same time, um, over 30 businesses who operate um, in both the waste and recycling sector have received um, tax credit. So it's a really good program, again, to incentivize um, those companies who are um, in waste management, recycling, and the circular economy. Um, we also offer a job growth incentive tax credit, which um, those companies that are creating um, jobs uh, in the private sector um, can receive, uh, and, and those jobs might be going to another state, we compete for them and we give performance-based uh, job growth incentive tax credits. I'll give a couple of examples of this later on in my presentation. Um, we have a strategic fund job growth incentive uh, where we, um, for those companies, get a cash payment that create and maintain new jobs, particularly in, in sectors that are important to us, such as a clean, um, a clean energy sector. And then finally, we have our advanced industry program, um, which provides funding to seven high technology industries, such as biosciences and tech and aerospace. But most importantly, it includes um, energy, natural resources, and clean technology. Um, and in fact, clean, techno clean uh, technology businesses, which include recycling businesses, receive a statula statutorily de dedicated resources under this program. Um, and so we know that a portion of this program is just devoted to incentivizing um, uh, early stage capital uh, for clean energy businesses. And um, to date, over the last eight years since the program's been in place, about $19 million have been deployed um, to this sector. So, um, you know, any, and businesses are, are taking stewardship of the circular economy and are using these incentives to further support the circular economy. So I wanna go through, um, so you know, some really great businesses in Colorado are taking um, advantage of some of the programs that we have uh, uh, to support their industry. Uh, number one is you might be familiar with Ebraz in Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, they're a steel mill. And uh, in November of 17, they received uh, the job growth incentive tax credit. Um, and just recently, they decided to move forward with a $500 million expansion using solar power and recycled materials in their steel mill operations. Um, and this manufacturing expansion will be accompanied by a 250 million, 240 megawatt solar facility that's been developed with Excel Energy and Lighthouse BP. So we're really excited about what's going on um, in Pueblo. Um, we also awarded Vortega. They are a um, carbon recycler in Golden. They got three of our advanced industry uh, grants uh, to support their business and growth. Um, also, through our advanced industry grants, we are supporting innovation and new models of recycling. Um, for example, we awarded uh, $250,000 to Nine Fiber. Uh, Nine Fiber is a biomass recycler, and they uh, we are supporting their efforts to transform cannabis and hemp waste stocks into industrial and textile products. Um, and they're a company that's, I think, doing very well um, and thriving. 
Uh, but these efforts aren't just at the macro uh, or the micro level, but also at the macro level as well. You know, Colorado has a two, $62 billion outdoor recreation industry. Um, and this industry has really established themselves as a conscientious leaders by advocating for conservation accords, which is a shared ideology embraced uh, by outdoor recreation offices around the country, known as the Confluence of States. Um, and at the industry's largest retail show, the um, Outdoor Retailer Show in Denver last year, they adopted um, the single-use plastic pledge where any retailer participating that, in that show um, agrees not to use or provide single plastic use waste bottles. I think they're setting a really good example uh, for trade shows um, really around the state and, and around the country. Um, we're also proud of, of companies that we have incentivized with our strategic fund job growth incentive, companies like Geyser, whose travel road shower has really revolutionized, revolutionized camping and water delivery. Um, they were in another state and they relocated to Colorado because of our conscientious mindset for water. Um, and so now they are getting contracts with, with FEMA, um, with refugee communities um, and water poor, poor communities. So it was a, a great to get them here in the state and to help them uh, get their footing here in Colorado. You know, in addition, our tourism industry, which is, uh, you know, more and more tourists every year. Last year, uh, pre-COVID, we got 87 million people coming into the state of Colorado. Um, and we know people come here uh, because they want to be in our beautiful and great outdoors. Um, and so we are really, we are leading the way with, with tourism and establishing our Care for Colorado principles. Um, We're encouraging visitors when they come to Colorado to minimize their use of single plastics um, and minimize their use on the environment through our Leave No Trace campaign. Um, that's become a strategic advantage for us as well because people come to Colorado because they know that we are, are mindful of the environment um, and they should be too when they visit our beautiful state. Um, we're also partnering our tourism office with our energy office um, to provide charging stations all along our scenic byways. Uh, to promote use of electric vehicles. And in fact, uh, two of our welcome centers in the state, one in Burlington um, and uh, the other one in Southern Colorado, just installed fast charging electric uh, vehicle charging stations in Colorado um, because we wanna, wanna be known as, as a state that really is, is working hard to, to protect our environment. Um, in another example, um, we've been working with our Department of Local Affairs uh, to uh, support the restarting of the Alamosa Mushroom Farm. If you're not familiar with that, it's in the San Luis Valley. Um, and many inputs into the farm, including fertilizer, our recycled waste products from other nearby Colorado businesses. Um, and waste products from the mushroom farm, such as spent compost, are then recycled into law lawn enhancement products, and then they're sold to other businesses in Colorado as part of that supply chain. So that's a nice example um, in the San Luis Valley. Um, and then in Lamar, Colorado, in the uh, very um, uh, uh, eastern and southern part of the state, Colorado Mills um, is a company that we have supported that's an environmentally friendly, zero waste, full cycle. Uh, company dedicated to farmers um, uh, with their sunflower products. So uh, they are harvesting healthy oil while using the byproducts for feed and grain for other businesses in the nearby area. And then finally, in the northeast corner of the state in Fort Morgan, um, our office recently provided state incentives uh, to see our energy concepts. Um, and they have developed and patented a waste resource conversion system um, that converts, converts waste into baseload energy. And they're using municipal 
municipal solid waste um, and used tires generating electricity, much like natural gas. So we're excited about, about that company um, in the Northeast part of the state. So you know, these are just a few examples of some of the great companies um, in Colorado that have recycling deeply woven um, into their operations and their business models. Um, and again, this is happening in every corner um, in the state of Colorado. Uh, so in, con in conclusion, um, you know, our, our economy is full of examples of good stewardship for people who are reusing, renewing, um, and take recycling very seriously. Um, and we are, are working with them and we're committed to fostering an economy that reduces the human impact on our environment. And, and we're pleased to be with you today and, and really be part of this very important and necessary conversation. So with that, um, I'll end my presentation and um, I think I might have uh, time if there are one or, one or two questions. Thank you, Betsy. Yeah, great insights. And this, to say the state is doing a tremendous job would be an understatement. Lots of exciting things happening in the state of Colorado. And I think a, a question that came in, that's a great question. Um, somebody asked, where's the best place to get information in regards to OEDIT's work, the companies that have been supported, as well as grants and resources that are available? Yes, actually, I meant to put, I should have that on my slide. Um, if you just go to choosecolorado.com, again, it's choosecolorado.com, choose um, and uh, just put in, um, you know, in the search advanced industry, or just even programs, just put in programs in a list all of these various programs that we have to support businesses. Um, we'll have examples of some companies that have been supported. You know, I would particularly for, for, um, for young companies, uh, point them to our advanced industry program. Um, that provides, we work a lot with universities, for instance, who um, uh, have technologies coming out of the university system that might need some proof of concept funding. Um, or young companies that might need those that might be looking for uh, private capital, um, but we'll give them a little bit of state support um, to know that then they can go ahead and get some additional capital to, uh, to finance um, some of these great new companies in the clean, clean energy field. Great, thank you. And one last one, I know you have to jump off, but there was a question in regards to um, how do you see OEDIT working with the new end market center being set up by SB55? You know, I'm not that familiar with that right now, and so I would love to get additional information um, and 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 get connected and, and work more in partnership if I could become more familiar with that. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, there's, there's our I think there's a session tomorrow afternoon that is going to actually dive into SB 55 and Market Center. Um, also for attendees that are interested. So I think thank you very much, Betsy thank Murphy, much for, uh, for joining us today. You bet. Good yeah. luck. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have John up. Our next speaker, John Lair. Welcome, John. Thank you for joining us and excited to, to see your presentation here. Great. Thanks, Alicia. And good to join all of you. I see loads of familiar names in the attendee list. So good to, good to be here. I do miss our in-person uh, summits, but hey, this is pretty cool too. Um, yeah, I'm president of Momentum Recycling. Uh, we've been around about 12 years. Um, before that, uh, I came from the technology world. Uh, I was originally trained as a systems engineer and had a few tech businesses along the way before diving into the sustainability world and, and uh, recycling and found our way into glass recycling. Um, so we can move to the next slide. Um, so briefly what we do, for those of you who don't know us, we take uh, bottle glass waste from single stream recycling programs um, along the front range. Uh, we clean or refine this glass waste so that it can be used by uh, local container manufacturing partners to make new bottles again. So essentially we enable bottle to bottle closed loop recycling uh, right here in Colorado. So a true circular economy for glass. Uh, next slide. Um, so at Momentum, we think Colorado is a great place to build more circular economies. Um, 
So in order to do that, we need to attract more end markets and more processors. I think we all know that. Um, the barriers to this, um, th there are some serious challenges and I'll just address briefly our experience with these challenges in hopes that they help kind of frame the discussion uh, around how we can make it more attractive for others. Um, next slide, please. Uh, for us, the first was supply. Um, getting enough bottle glass waste was harder than we expected. Uh, we were surprised, not being a Colorado company, when we came here, we were surprised to find that there are a lot of communities in Colorado where recycling is not available or is optional and cost prohibitive. Um, this we also found to be true with large portions of the business sector. Um, so the volumes um, that we have to recycle each month are lower than what we expected. Um, so this is a problem, not just for us, but it would be a problem for any processor or any manufacturer that relies on recyclable material uh, to operate. So governments have an opportunity to help set the table here um, so that we can ensure that recycling infrastructure is available to, to every resident, every, every, uh, every business patron, then we're going to help ensure that there's more supply which, in, uh, as I said, would be attractive to other processors and manufacturers. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the other challenge uh, is, is on the demand side. So, um, you know, for us, there's only a few uh, customers, our two uh, wonderful bottle manufacturing partners, uh, Rocky Mountain Bottle Company and uh, Owens, Illinois. Um, that the issue with that is when there's an issue at one supplier, the opportunity to sell product and generate revenue is greatly impacted. And in the extremely rare circumstance that there would be a problem at both uh, at, at both uh, um, customers, you know, you can't sell your material at all. Um, we, you know, again, we're grateful uh, for the partnership and this closed loop wouldn't happen without all of us, all, the, all of our organizations doing this together. Um, it is risky. And if, uh, it, for other potential processors or manufacturers looking at, at where to locate their next operation, you know, they're going to look at, at Colorado and think about um, what are the different opportunities they have to sell their product and how do they minimize that risk. Um, the other part of this is that manufacturers could be better incented to use more recycled content in the product. Um, they're, you know, we're competing with virgin materials. Um, from our perspective, and that uh, can be somewhat difficult, especially when some of these are low cost materials like SAMs and such. So um, if there could be incentives for these manufacturers to help, uh, it, you know, incentivize them to use uh, more uh, recycled content instead of virgin materials, um, that would then in turn drive up the demand for products from processors like us, um, would help drive up the percentage of recycled content in products. And, you know, again, for new potential processors or end users looking at Colorado as the next place to do business, um, that's going to help reduce the risk for them and, and increase um, you know, the opportunity for them in, in Colorado, maybe help them choose Colorado over some of the other options they might have. So incentives can greatly help ensure strong demand. Um, so that's a, some, you know, kind of another, another key area. Um, there are others, um, but these are just the two you know, main things that jumped out on the supply side and the demand side. It's great, as Betsy just talked about, the other incentives that are available, uh, tax credits and, uh, and and incentives for job creation and those things, they're fantastic. Um, I'm just suggesting that, you know, if we really want to drive more circular economies in the state of Colorado, these are some of the additional challenges we're going to have to find a way to address as a state and, and as, a, as a community. Um, next slide, please. So my summary um quickly is that uh you know we face more challenges uh in opening our denver area glass recycling plant than we expected um other potential processors and end users are going to have the same challenges and so again we need to kind of come together to find a way to mitigate these challenges so that we can attract more processors more end users and build more circular economies and address these, these solutions that we've all been talking about here so hopefully our experience is uh beneficial uh and helps uh uh you know, shed some light on uh, what we're talking about here. So uh, with that, I can stop and take some questions if there's time. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, I think for the sake of time, we're gonna move to the next presenter so we can have uh, questions for all of you here at the end. Um, 
please make sure to type your questions in the Q&A box for John. I think John, um, the, the glass opportunity in Colorado is phenomenal. I think that was one of our biggest takeaways when we came to Denver when Raj and I visited, not to mention the Miller Coors Tour is pretty incredible, the bottling facility. But the glass opportunity is massive and could be uh, actually circularized, which would set the bar really high for the rest of the country in this space. So that's exciting. So um, moving on to our next presenter, um, remember, keep your questions coming. We were gonna, we're gonna get to them after the next few panelists. Um, we have Sarah, Sarah Axelrod, who is joining us from Ball as the North American Sustainability Lead. Sarah, do you wanna welcome? Thank you for joining us and uh, let's get started. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as Alicia mentioned, I uh, lead sustainability for Ball Corporation here in North and Central America. Really exciting. I've actually only been in this job since January, which, you know, as I'm sure many of you know, it's starting a new job. I, I guess I did a couple months in the office, but as the world has changed, getting up to speed uh, from the comfort of my house. Um, prior to joining Ball, so I've spent my whole career in corporate sustainability, um, but prior to this, I was leading um, marketing and innovation for the sustainability team at Land Lake, so on the farmer-owned cooperative side, and doing a lot of regenerative agriculture, you know, which of course leads directly into the circularity of packaging um, and how I came, came to be at Ball. So if we want to go to the next slide. So, you know, many people I think on this call are aware that Ball no longer does the glass mason jars that everybody knows and loves, um, but we are actually the largest can manufacturer in the world. And so globally, our footprint from a can manufacturing perspective is, is much larger than the next four combined. And so when we talk about the circular economy, really thinking about aluminum and Ball as a case study is part of my position is how can we use our market position to help shape what a circular economy could look like. And for us, you know, very much as John talked about from the manufacturing side, that's the corner of the universe that we control, right? The materials and the products that we create to make them easier to recycle and make them more circular. So, you know, back to Jamie's conversation about the infrastructure needed, right? We need to create materials that help that infrastructure be more effective. And so when we think about aluminum, a couple of great facts here, um, Right, aluminum is an infinite material. So again, back to Jamie's point of making sure we capture the value of that material, aluminum continues to be valuable over and over and over and over and over again. So a cup can be, an aluminum cup can be an aluminum can, can be back to an aluminum can and recycled back on the shelf in just 60 days. Um, aluminum also has the highest average recycled content here in the US of any other substrate material. So right now it's about 73% recycled content. And, you know, that's a great number. It's very high. Um, I encourage you all to tune into tomorrow's presentation where we go into the, the recent life cycle analysis we did, looking at this recycled content number and how we can actually even make that a little bit higher and increase the circularity of these materials. And, you know, finally, a great call to action here. Right now, 50% of cans are recycled here in the US. Um, and even though they have the highest recycling yields of any packaging material, 50% of cans is still really low compared to the rest of the world. So we're spending a lot of our time here making sure that, you know, because this is a very infinitely and easily recycled material, we're getting as much back into the system as humanly possible. So going to the next slide, when we think about sustainability at Ball, it really breaks down into these, these five key areas. The first is understanding that, you know, we want to use as much recycled content as possible but if we can't, and that remaining virgin material, that we're doing everything we can to responsibly source that aluminum. So working with ASI, the Aluminum Stewardship Initiative, to make sure that all of our plants are receiving ASI certified metal. As of now, 100% of our plants in Europe are receiving um, and are certified for ASI metal. And our hope is in the next year that all of our US plants will be as well, including the plant here in Colorado. Uh, the second pillar is, you know, under this manufacturing and again, manufacturing for circularity with and designing with circularity in mind, um, no using no materials of concern. So working very closely with cradle to cradle to make sure that all of our inks, coatings, dyes, et cetera, meet these cradle to cradle certification. Um, so this is an ongoing process. And, you know, every time we switch out a varnish or a coating, we're working with cradle to cradle to, to ensure that that material health. 
Uh, the third pillar, making the most metal efficient can. We, we, we can, pun intended. Um, as you can see in this, in this uh, graphic, you know, that 12 ounce standard can that everybody uses, looking at, okay, should we think about a 12 ounce sleek can? Same volume, less metal um, in that sleeker design. You know, you might uh, be familiar with this can from, it's a very common packaging format for seltzers. Moving on to the fourth pillar here, sustainable operations and climate leadership. So working with all of our plants to make sure that we are leading on using renewable energy. So for example, 100% of our plants by the end of this year in the US will use and be renewable energy to make our cans. Um, our science-based targets were just approved by the Science-Based Target Initiative. So when we think about our science-based targets and our scope one and scope two, that's actually the scope three of many of our big customers, right? Coke, Pepsi, ABI, you know, companies that have tremendous sustainability goals around circularity. It, you know, it's our job to help them meet those as their, as their packaging manufacturer. And finally, this last bucket is where I spend a lot of my time is really figuring out, as we've talked about, recycling rates of metal here in the U.S. And it's not just about collection, right? It's about the real recycling of, the, of these materials. And so supporting an infrastructure all the way from how we design the package all the way through, you know, the uh, full material flow all the way to making sure we get that metal back, remelted re and back into a can in less than 60 days. Um, so moving on to the next slide, you know, in the essence of time, I just, I love this case, oh yeah, this one. Uh, I love this case study. And for those of you who have been to the Pepsi Center recently, or maybe a CU or a CSU game uh, in the last year, you've seen the pilot of these cups. When we think about needing to be innovative, and again, from our corner of the world, designing for circularity, we need new products that help support a more circular economy. And so this is the aluminum cup, which, you know, I hope you all have seen. If you haven't, it is on as of this morning. Uh, very exciting in here at King Supers in Colorado, but you know, hoping to scale up this more sustainable and more circular alternative to some of the other you know, cups that are out on the market. So again, a brand new product, but with the intent that it is, it can be treated just like a can. It can be recycled again and back on the shelf in 60 days. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Adam, but, and I realized I did not include my email and contact in this last slide. I, I'll chat it in the box, happy to answer any questions about aluminum, anything that we're doing, and, and please feel free and reach out. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sarah, and that is a, a, an amazing case study. Uh, it's probably one of the areas that uh, to bring to the forefront more, more often than not, a lot of circularity looks at back end of waste and this is putting the design at front and center in terms of packaging and such. Um, I see a couple questions that we'll get to after Adam's presentation around um, materials and packaging and uh, plastic wrap with labels. So um, we'll dive in with that. I would love to introduce um, our final and last speaker before we dive into the panel discussion, Adam Hill is a, as the owner of Direct Polymers there in Colorado. Hey, how's it going guys? Um, I'm Adam, the owner of Direct Polymers in Denver. Um, I wanted to kind of highlight today some of the challenges that Colorado and the US in general is facing um, with regard to circular economies and then um, provide you know, some potential solutions and suggestions uh, and also discuss what our company has been doing to kind of move the state along in, in the circularity area. I also wanted to tell Sarah uh, on those cups, I love those. Um, they're, they're awesome. They're one of the best circularity inventions that I've seen in a long time. Um, we appreciate so bravo, that, thanks. <laughs> bravo on that. Um, but uh, anyway, there's a lot of information on these slides, um, but I wanted, you know, I wanted everyone to have those so they could read through them and, and take a look at them. Uh, so if you want to go to the first slide, next slide. Okay, so um, I wanted to just kind of highlight some of the unique um, economical and logistical uh, challenges, which are sort of constraining the profitability of the supply chains here locally and uh, how those, you know, kind of play into um, becoming hurdles for developing circular economies. So, you know, first, 
Colorado sort of a very weird, unique spot to try to recycle. We have um, very high freight costs because it's very difficult to get in and out of the state. Uh, you know, you really have nothing to the north, nothing to the east, nothing to the south, and then mountains to the west. Um, so freight rates can chew up a lot of the margin uh, on some of the commodities that are trying to be recycled. And when you're shipping from long distances in or out of state, uh, that can really constrain sort of what your options are. Uh, particularly in these markets where commodity prices are almost at record lows. Um, it's also very expensive to operate a business in Colorado. Uh, there's, you know, I think we're still at a sub 4% vacancy rate on commercial properties. Uh, labor, you know, is, is high. I know we pay our people well above, uh, you know, a minimum wage type rate. Which, which I prefer to do, but uh, I think we're approaching an average of about $20 an hour right now. So again, with, uh, you know, with the low price of recycled commodities, um, the labor and the freight play a huge part in our expenses. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that kind of plays into the next uh, bullet point, which is there's a big lack of end users who use recycled content or end users in general, particularly in the plastics field uh, in Colorado. There's a, a lot of small injection molding companies, but there's no like heavy hitting, high volume use end users. And I think a big part of that obviously is because of the first two bullet points that I discussed, it's difficult to operate a company here uh, on the type of margins that we work on right now. Um, so I do think incentivizing, you know, as John mentioned, some companies to come here to mandate more recycled end use uh, content in their products where, where applicable um, are, are all very important. And I'll kind of talk about that some more on one of the next slides. And then, uh, you know, one of the other things I wanted to mention is even if we can get these guys to use more recycled content in their products and maybe make the packaging more easily recyclable, whatever it is on the manufacturing side, we don't have the infrastructure right now in Colorado to manage a lot of the recyclable plastics that are being generated. So I think, you know, first and foremost, we need to, to kind of get our infrastructure in place and get our house in order before we can even take on uh, some of these recycling tasks. We've, uh, we've worked closely with REO and some of the other organizations to try to add some new stuff. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit too, but uh, we do have a long way to go as far as building up our local infrastructure. Next slide. <clears throat> so, you know, there was a couple other things that I wanted to mention and I got to move this over so I can see. Um, so, you know, just in general, we're facing some other hurdles, which are very, very important um, in my eyes. You know, we have, like I said, recycled commodity prices are very, very low. We're competing with prime resin. If you talk to a manufacturer, uh, you know, the, the two options are basically buy virgin material or buy recycled material. When you deal with recycled material, you're going to, you're going to have a lot more um, issues. You know, there's some recycled material that's processed. Well, there's other uh, recycled material that causes issues, but regardless, you're going to have a higher yield loss percentage when you deal with recycles. So they want it priced, you know, significantly lower um, than to purchase the, the virgin material. Otherwise it makes more sense for them to use uh, brand new stuff. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, there's a lot of packaging that says it's recyclable and uh, it's not, you know, it might be made with recyclable materials. It might be marked, you know, with a recycled number, but in reality, a lot of these materials are not being recycled. I know Neil just asked a question earlier. I saw about you know, the plastic labeling that goes on to a metal cup or whatever, they, they tend to intermingle a lot of these plastics and other materials together, which make them almost impossible to recycle, again, particularly in, you know, kind of depressed markets. So um, that also plays into the next bullet point, which is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of confusion, it seems, uh, among the public to not truly understand how the recycling is working and also to sort of uh, figure out what these products are made out of. So I think we need to limit some of that confusion. Um, and then, you know, the systems that we have in place right now, 
they're very interdependent how all this stuff works, the collection, the processing, the manufacturing, but they still uh, are very sort of loosely connected. They don't, they, they, they don't all tie in together, which makes it very difficult to design a system of circularity where, you know, each person sort of plays into how these things uh, get recycled properly uh, and manufactured properly. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, there's a lot of new mandates going into place like Coca-Cola, uh, Nestle, Purina, a lot of people saying that we're going to mandate X amount of recycled content um, to go into these products. And I, a, a lot of the supply is not necessarily available. So they're sort of putting the, the cart before the horse and saying that we want to do these things, but they're not necessarily checking, is that supply available? Well, they are checking. They, they, have, they have blatantly stated that, but they're also not checking is that supply available and the infrastructure in place to get that supply recycled. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is the sort of this, the complexity of how things are being made at this point with new additives, new uh, co-extrusions, things like that are sort of outpacing what we're able to do in the recycling world right now. So I think getting those two on the same page a little bit better is very, very important. Um, the, okay, next slide. Okay, so I put some suggested uh, things in here about what we can do to sort of improve this. And sorry, these people just started, uh, hang on one second, guys. Sorry guys. Okay. So anyway, real quick, uh, as Raj mentioned, I think we need to move away from the linear model and sort of transition more towards the circular economy in doing that. Um, I think that some of the manufacturing initiatives need to align with the realities of the current system. And that is a multiple, uh, multi pronged approach where the, cons the producers, the consumers and the processors all sort of need to be on the same page. Um, to build on sort of our existing processes and tools and then expand on them to make them a lot better. Um, and then I also wrote in here, you know, the end of life recyclability is determined uh, where it's originally designed and manufactured. So we need the brand commitments um, for the, you know, to mandate some of that recycled material to go back into these products. Um, I also mentioned, uh, so I said, have advocacy efforts to protect and expand mechanisms supporting the economics of recycling at the state, uh, local and federal levels. So I do think there's some stuff, I already mentioned mandating recycled content to go in. I think the grants that are being put forth right now and uh, put into place are very, very important because we're working in depressed markets. Uh, I think we absolutely need better sorting technologies, um, collection methods, processing capabilities, and infrastructures here locally, specifically. Because um, I, as I mentioned, we're not very prepared to deal with what's being generated locally. Um, and then promoting uh, and creating robust end markets plays into finding better solutions um, for the hurdles of operating in Denver and uh, also back to the mandating, you know, as much re recycled content as uh, we can going into some of these products. There are products that are not going to be able to use recycled content, such as medical supplies and things like that. But when you're talking about making a pallet or a tote or, you know, something that's very, very basic and general and has general purpose use, especially in warehousing and distribution, where you see a lot of in Denver, um, I think that there's no reason not to mandate uh, recycle contents go into those products because it's, it's a pretty easy fix. Um, and then I also said, you know, obviously eliminate problematic and unnecessary packaging that plays into Neil's question with, you know, we have all these labels and, and strange materials that say they're recyclable, but are not really recyclable. Uh, critical investments is back to the grants and, and involvement from the state or possibly putting in, you know, the central recycling facility like we've been talking about where 
there's discounted rates on real estate or something like that for some of the recyclers working on real tight margins. And uh, basically stop confusing consumers. I mean, I, I'll walk up to any corporate location to throw something into a trash can and they might have four bins, but they're marked with 50 different pictures and labels and things. And as a recycler, I get confused of where to put things. So, you know, with a, with a pretty good understanding of the materials. So I know that the consumers are very, very confused. I'll speed it up real quick because I know I'm running out of time, but basically I just wanted to highlight sort of, you know, what we're doing as a company is we're trying to bring everything closer to home. So we're basically trying to, our company received an REO grant. We've invested a lot of our own money recently. We put in more industrial recycling capacity. We've added a post-consumer line so that we can start using some of these post-consumer plastics to go in with the industrial plastics that we're doing. And then we also uh, are installing a compounding line with the goal of being able to blend a lot of these plastics together. And the, the goal with that is to basically take things that are you know, low margin materials that don't often get recycled and blend them with our higher margin stuff so that we can sort of add those in and, and up the recycling rates of the harder to recycle materials. And then also to blend to spec for a lot of the local companies that are manufacturing products because the guys that do manufacture currently in Colorado re require a very specific spec. And so we're trying to take these materials, blend them to what they need so that they can be sold locally to eliminate those freight costs, to offer better rebates around town, to get better pricing for the products, all the above. And then the next slide kind of just plays into that better rebates around town. We want to limit, uh, you know, our reliance on overseas markets by creating better local uh, options for some of these guys. And Colorado has always been heavily dependent on export. Keep materials out of the landfill. The one thing I didn't mention is our landfill tipping fees are some of the cheapest in the country. So that absolutely has to be addressed because a lot of these companies that are only looking at margins are going to look to, uh, to throw something away a lot quicker than they are to recycle it right now. Adam, thank you. You have done a tremendous job of really hitting a lot of the opportunities, but challenges that come with driving circularity. And I think there is, um, there is an understatement from across the value chain in terms of the complexity of what it really takes to do this. So it is no small feat by any means and definitely applaud organizations um, that have spoken today, uh, Adam, Sarah, John, um, Betsy and, and, and Raj, in regards to just the work that's being put in to try to figure out um, answers to some of these challenges and opportunities. Um, definitely some of the ones that were mentioned were in, gar in regards to standardization of materials um, on the front end in terms of when they're designed. So they're designed for recyclability and standardizations around recyclability. There's a lot happening right now in conversations around policy at the national level for recyclability, so I would, engage, I would encourage everybody on the call if that's an interest to um, look into opportunities, not just in your state, but also nationally on how to engage in those conversations. Regionalization was a theme that was brought to light today. Um, the need for potentially regionalizing efforts, driving collaboration across the value chains to not just design on the front end, but also on the back end to be able to collect the amount of materials needed. Um, and then also, um, really how to drive collaboration due to the need, um, not just to aggregate materials, but to drive and market solutions. And the fact that a lot of these systems are actually interdependent. Uh, and, and so then also the supply and demand issues. If corporations have an interest in using recycled materials, how do we collect more to increase that opportunity? Designing systems of circularity, I actually wrote that down when Adam said that, that's something we also feel has been um, is a very important theme, and you know, bringing stakeholders together across value chains. That was kind of the goal of this keynote. How do we bring people from the front end to the back end across materiality, and of course, the public and private sector to start to have these conversations. And then the speed of complexity in regards to plastic innovation, and I would say material innovation, not just plastics. And how do, how do different entities? Um, kind of keep up, if you will, in regards to the pace of uh, material innovation and then also the innovation that's happening 
um, on the back end in terms of collections uh, and, and processing. Uh, Colorado has AMP Robotics, um, which is a, a pretty amazing uh, company that's looking at designing for uh, material recovery facility upgrades and optimization. So um, with that, we, uh, we are going to take the questions that have been posted um, just for the sake of time to be able to provide answers online via email so we can assure to answer all the questions that were asked today. So I'll let Brandy close and thank you for everybody's time today. Thank you so much, Alicia, and thank you to everyone that joined this webinar today. I mentioned it was going to be action packed and it certainly was. So uh, please make your way to the business partner showcase and all of the other wonderful meet and greet and sessions um, throughout the rest of today and tomorrow. And again, we will post the answers to your questions um, later. So thank you for all the great questions and have a good rest of your day.